<clears throat> again, man, thank you so much for, for coming yeah. on. It's my great pleasure. Thank you for having me. Dude, great. I, I, I wanted to start with this. What part of Massachusetts are you from, man? Uh, the North Shore, Beverly, Mass. It's right by Salem. Okay, very nice. Yeah. You got are you witch. from Massachusetts? I am not. I'm not. But my, my grandmother is. She's from Cambridge. I lived in Cambridge. Oh, wow. Or okay. I, I, yeah. I, yeah. Boston, Beverly, Massachusetts. Motherfucker. What a hell of a goddamn state. Um, <laughs> yeah. Witchy shit. I've been accused of being a witch multiple times. Yeah. Um, I mean, you're, you're right there. You're, you're right at the stake, basically. Basically. I'm, my, I'm sure in my backyard may have been a stake location at one point, honestly. Um, <laughs> but it's funny. Yeah. Definitely baptized twice. Was accused of being a witch interested in the witch trials but as a kid from beverly it seems like they basically i feel like all of elementary middle school and even most of high school all history class or social studies was mainly the salem witch trials it was so easy for the teachers because it was like a halloweeny thing they could really skirt past all the you know deeper more fucked up and malicious shit going on and kind of make it fun for everyone but then uh Salem itself is great because there's still a really wonderful, active witch community. Still, and, to, as of yeah, today. There's, yes, there's a woman, Lori Cabot. I love her if she's listening. She one time um, sent a raven feather to the chief of police of uh, Salem because her daughter was arrested on who knows. I mean, she may have been doing something she shouldn't have been doing. But I just love that she threatened the motherfucker with a raven feather. Yeah, that's some Edgar Allan Poe, Poe shit right there for sure. God bless him, fucking a. <laughs> what kind of what kind of stuff were you getting into as a kid for for oh fun? Oh Jesus! I mean, I loved Halloween as a kid. I'm trying to think what are you, what age range we're we talking at. Um, I'm talking about later later teens, fifteen, ooh, later, sixteen. Yeah. All right. Well, I loved you know skateboarding, uh, rock and roll. Uh, smoking clove cigarettes well let's see here i mean to really get i guess you know i liked all kinds of wacky shit that kids liked back then i liked nintendo 64 but i didn't have one i um always had been into you know arty shit but like in a way that obviously led me to be i mean i was obsessed with new metal like i said i love corn love limp biscuit all that stuff it really had like a visceral impact on me and I mean, God, that could be its own whole show. I feel like we talk about that. And out of context, people will probably just laugh. But I just spent a lot of time living with a um, single mom and grew up in a pretty comfortable-ish town. But, you know, I don't know. I can't imagine it was much different than most, like, I don't know, white kid suburban upbringings. Um, I did have a pet alien, though. Oh, Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. I don't know. That's a tough one to a tough question to answer. You know, I think that I just like always wanted to pursue shit that was like considered a hobby to people at best and kind of like I feel like I was always kind of I have a lot of memories of being reminded that I had to like stop using my imagination, which is kind of a sad thing to reflect back on. But like that's not the world we live in now. And so fuck it. Yeah. You know, did the best with what I had, I guess. I don't know. It's hard to say. I feel sure. like a kid sure. still in a lot of ways. <laughs> that's that, 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 that's good. I mean, you gotta, you gotta keep, you gotta keep your, your youth within you. Right. It's like the best, you know, thinking about it, you know, I have two young kids and it's amazing to see um, just how much they're able to absorb and, taken to account given their like limited scope i mean really the world like reality even mortality you know they're not even really quite self-aware of that sort of like all things yet. like they know things that will hurt but even that process like getting to that point having to fucking put shit into the electrical sockets being a parent for the first four years is just like it's everything you realize everything you own is like a kill a kill item a weapon for a kid and so like it's a relief when you finally get to the point where you're like so you know electricity and water can't be a thing right or like you get that you can't like lean on a window like that or you know there's choking and shit anyway what i'm saying is with all the negative 
sort of things associated with how easy it is for a kid to like make an obvious mistake and um, you know fucking ruin everything for everybody. Uh, there's so much out there that they like that is just pure like pleasure and joy. The satisfaction they get out of the shit that bothers us is so fascinating to me. I mean, even like my kids have been lucky enough to go back to school during this, and they're uh, uh, truly shit. My kids are six and four years old. And sorry, I just had a moment with that. But <laughs> it was crazy because everybody was like, it's going to be so awful. So I feel so bad for the kids because of the masks and shit. Do you know kids put up with the craziest shit? My son is the messiest boy alive. Kids go out of their way to do shit that we're uncomfortable with. They love to jump in puddles and be messy and they don't give a flying fuck about what they have to do as long as they get to use their imaginations with their friends. Way shittier when we've had to do like virtual learning, way shittier. And I guess what I'm getting at is I'm so enamored by their like, what they have like an endless sort of capacity for imagination. And I know that that will happen, like just by virtue of being a human that's alive, it'll be limited to what, you know, when kids start to get into shit that make some part of society, like society, and they become more self-aware of like how they fit in and what can they be, what can they do? And like, on the one hand, of course, I want them to feel like they can do whatever they want, but I also get that like they might not feel that way. And there's not a whole lot I can do about it, except for right now, encourage them to like go, you know, hog wild out there. And I guess seeing them behave that way and really get so much out of things we take for granted makes me want to be more like that, which is why I'm building a fucking playhouse in this barn, motherfucker. It's going to be crazy out there. You've got to come by. <laughs> yeah, dude. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll swing by. Yeah, definitely. Get, Will you? Get it? Yeah, definitely. If I, if I, because I'm, I'm on the West right now. Oh, I'm, I'm ever out there. Are you in Los Angeles? I, I'm not. Orange County. Ah, oh, did you, have you seen us play in Orange County? I was supposed to see you guys once. Bought the ticket and everything. No, 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 no. I think I think you guys. No, this is not in Orange County. That I I would have to go. I would. It was in. It was in Los Angeles, and I did. I wasn't able to make it. Uh And uh, and and obviously now I look back on it, I say, oh man, I should have should have really, really done it. It's all right, man. We'll be back. I'm trying to get back as soon as possible. I miss California. I love California. Yeah, it's great. It's a great. It's a great state. Um, it's nice to live here. Huge. Um, yeah. We've actually had notoriously bad luck in Orange County specifically. One of the members of our of Parquet Courts has suffered, he has had seizures like every time we've gone there. Like Orange County makes him have seizures. Yeah. Um, it's it, We're lesser known for doing that, but that is, yeah, that is a side effect. Yeah, it's a side effect. And um, I mean, you just got to kind of be privy to it and, and just know that that's, that is a... Uh, possibility um people gotta get the word out there is what i'm saying yeah that, that that's true and and we're we're kind of kind of doing some groundbreaking stuff right now as discussing it because it's kind of hush me. hush right now i mean that's that, that that's really what it is that, that we're really well, kinda, they're always trying to keep it under wraps that's the big problem yeah it's um it's a big county but you talk about big pharma but the the big county is is the real issue here but uh and it's orange because half the population is like a, on the yellow party and the other half is uh, what red party, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. What a weird, 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 weird town. Had nothing to, to do with the orange groves at all. Uh, a lot of people think, oh, yeah. or No, 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 no. It's all Florida. All the orange it's fucking juice. nuts, man. I've been telling people that for years. It's so funny to be an orange in general must suck so much because it's like your fruit that's named the color that you are or is the color named the like that because of the fruit like who the fuck came first yeah the the, the somatics and, and the jury's still out on that um yeah it, i'm sure that, that there's got to be a person in like a comptroller of some kind out where you're at who just basically does spends their whole day working on shit like that yeah def- definitely there's a, there's a lot of money being pushed around um sure. to silence people and, and such but not me not yeah, i, yeah. I That's yeah. why i'm out here god damn it i love you jacob yeah i love you too sean this is this is great yeah. i'm so glad that we were able to work this out man and I'm happy for being here. I want. I just like feel like I, I know you already. Yeah, I know. We, we got through so much, man. But but and here we are now, right? Yeah, it's we can great. start talking about real shit. I mean, I love. I could do the podcast in any form that you want. 
Yeah. Not happy. <laughs> <laughs> I I want to ask you this. What do you? What was your first job? What was what was the first job? Oh, I worked at. Uh, I was okay. My dad and brother live in Durango, Colorado, and I would go out to Colorado for summer and the uh, winter and whatever. And my very first job was working at the mountain purgatory mountain as like you know i worked there doing the bullshit that was available in the summer like the alpine slide it was kind of rotating shit like working at the little cafes and shops kind of did a little bit of everything um but then i went back to massachusetts and started my first job that i had for fucking ever from all, for all of high school even some of college at tapa's corner um completely ir- like an irreverent uh, poorly named ins- little burrito shop in Beverly that I loved as a kid and as a customer. And I honestly, I credit it to this day for so much of, of who I am. I'm wicked good at washing dishes. And uh, yeah, I love, I mean, I could talk about that job. It's really it has had a, a lot of impact. In a way. So how, how many years did you do that for? Okay. So 14 to honestly, probably about, I'd say 14 to, 20 but at a certain point you know there was like when i went to college it became a little more of a part-time thing and it changed ownership and actually became a different business but i was still in the same building so that was a little awkward but um yeah what so that's like six years or something like that yeah that's six years that's that's great that's that's a lot of time to spend doing anything let let alone a, a, a job holding it down yeah and as a kid it's like i didn't even really think of it as much it was you know you start out washing dishes and you next year like a line cook then you're doing i never really got good at the register i'll be honest to this day it scares me to imagine having to operate a cash register sure exact change cards and now, you now know, you got the, the phones give, too you know when people give you change sometimes it's something that pisses me off and i hate to say it but it does say i give you 20 dollars something that costs 18 dollars, and then they give you your change back and they go there's one and 19 is 20 like they count it backwards in a weird way you know what i'm talking about yeah yeah, yeah. Like I was, they like use it as a way. They tell you the change you're getting by reminding you the amount of money you gave them. It's, it feels like um, feels like a fucking magic trick or some kind of. I just I don't like I don't know where I'm going with that, but I, for reasons like that, I, I don't like the register. Yeah, no, definitely. It, it's it's for some people. It's it's different for others. Um, yeah, and yeah, yeah. Definitely. So you're you you're more of the of the of the burrito maker, yeah. You're you're more. I can of the... make a hell of a burrito. I love to make a burrito. I mean, I love the what you do with the burrito out on your side of the country. As I mean, my friend, it's if you could find. I wish I could recreate so much that I've so many burritos that I've enjoyed. I mean, to be honest, though, the burrito in California is like the roast beef sandwich of North of the North shore of Massachusetts, smaller area, but similar idea. Everybody does the same thing, but they're done differently enough such that like the regionally specific people are drawn to them for reasons that are like almost impossible to communicate to anybody unless you live in the town directly. Cause most of the time you're like, I want a burrito. I know California has great burritos, but I bet, you know, of all the burrito places where you are the best one of those. Sure, sure. But yeah, for a reason we could talk about all day, but I mean, I just understand you'll have you have a greater depth of knowledge than I do. So, oh, sure. I mean, I'm, I mean, cash registers, especially in in burrito places. That's that's what oh, I. They're, that's, yeah. they're excellent, excellent cash registers. But the the best, <laughs> definitely the best. Do you remember the first concert you went to? I sure do. I went to see the band Corn on the. Oh, actually, you know what? I'm sorry. That's not true. I saw Los Lobos live, Earth Day. Um, I must have been in fucking fifth grade. I met them, too, because my best friend, his mom and dad, they lived in California, and they were next-door neighbors with Los Lobos when they were just a little garage band. And they stayed in touch. And sure as shit, they rolled through town. I got to see them play in the green room and everything. I was wearing a Top Gun T-shirt, and they signed it. It was fucking awesome. But corn though, that was the first concert I wanted to go to for real. All right. Yeah. What how old are you when you when you went there? So awkward, dude. I was in eighth grade. So same kid's mom had to come with us. And it was um pretty X-rated shit going on. Um, 
it wasn't necessarily even a, a lot of the reason why I was drawn to that band, frankly, was just the two guitar players, Monkey and Head. I was obsessed with their style. Um, owned a seven string guitar myself. Um, but of course, their lyrical themes do tend to touch upon some sensitive shit. And um, their live show certainly reflected that. And there was a lot of like blow up dolls and weird sex crap. And I feel like maybe, I mean, it was nothing like Rammstein didn't play or anything and they do a lot of weird stuff on stage, but it was offered with the mom there because I do remember there just being illicit things happening that I felt uncomfortable having her see me see. Yeah, 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 definitely. I mean, but to their fairness, Korn's fairness, I mean, the, the R is backwards, right? It's so It's not for, it's not going the way that it would normally be. Yeah, so I mean, you already know that these guys are, are bringing something new to the table straight out of the gate. You fucking know it. I mean, that, yeah. that's part of the reason I love it so much. I, I just think that they were up to all kinds of no good. I feel like Fred Durst named their band or something. Now, that's not the way the story goes. The story that'd be, that'd be is amazing. That he had something to do with something. The logo, maybe he designed. Oh, yeah. Got, Fred Durst has to get his hands in there for sure. What was the first show that you played? Oh, my God. Okay. I was in a band, a ska band called Unemployed Sidekick. And I guess that must, oh, we, Northeastern University. Um, like, I think it was a morgue, honestly. My, so same best friend, but his dad, he, he's the, sort of the one who got it. You know, he was a musician as a kid. So he's the one who even introduced the concept of playing music to us at all. Like before this guy, like, I remember if you told me like, you played guitar or if you told me to draw you a picture of a guitar, for example, I'd just draw like a stick and like a, whatever, like, like the thing, like a cartoon dog would play like a broom and a, whatever the fuck. It was nothing. I didn't have any idea what a guitar was. I didn't realize it was even a thing that you couldn't, I didn't, I don't know. I, I didn't understand it as a coveted item. You know, I was still into skateboards, your fucking wave race, shit like that. Anyway, long story short, all of a sudden we're into music and I goddamn loved the crap. And we started a band immediately, Unemployed Sidekick, Ska. And this dude was a physical therapist and instructor at Northeastern University, happened to have, you know, a little faculty party or some shit. We got to play at that. And there was a morgue because they had to use cadavers for their studies. And I do remember seeing a dead body. At the, at the first show that you played, huh? Just, Multiple just... dead. Multiple dead. And dude, you know, it's so fucking crazy. I honestly hadn't thought about it until right now for so long. Anyway, it was pretty good. Yeah, the, uh, man, that's, I mean, you, you, you literally killed it. Who's I fucking so, killed it. That's right. Dead, pe- dead. Yes. Dude, yeah. So nuts. Yeah. Who's, who's to say that they, what the time of death was and if they died previous to you being there or you being there, who, who knows, right? Actually, Jacob, I do know that because they had the toe tags on. I knew exactly when they passed. They could have been quick with it, you know, like like real real quick with it, you know, put it, putting them on and, and marking it. Maybe they didn't oh, want yeah. you to think that you that you killed them. But that's great, man. That's a that's a the right way to kick it off, right? I cannot believe no one was got no one got in trouble for that. Even that there were snacks out. You know, I remember thinking that was weird. It, there's not it's not like okay to be able to smell formaldehyde or honestly see a dead body while you're enjoying like a little small little cucumber sandwich. Sure, sure. The the ambiance is odd. I will I'll, it's I'll give you not that. right. Gouch. <laughs> so when did you join uh Daniel Stripe Tiger? Founding member of that band. I guess that was I mean, fuck. June, sophomore year, junior year of high school. I feel like that whole pursuit began between, yeah, I want to say junior year because the other guitar player, I played guitar in that band. The other guitar player lived in Danvers, Mass. Um, and they've got their own whole roast beef thing going there. And <laughs> yeah, we met all of the people in that band. It's funny. We, grew, like at the time, I remember thinking it was so nuts that like, four guys who went to four different schools were in a band together, even though like all of our towns like touched each other and all of our, you know, it isn't that crazy, but like at the time it was like, it seemed like we were really fortunate because we all, there was a place in Massachusetts on the North shore, Gloucester mass, interesting roast beef situation there, that they had a, like an excellent art community um, as well as heroin. There was a lot of heroin there, but 
that's besides the point. But the thing is, the main thing is there's a place called Art Space, the Art Space, run by a dude named Shep Abbott, who you should look up on IMDb because he's most famous for writing the movie Chud, Cannibalistic Humanoid Underground Dwellers. Oh, boy. And he's a fucking interesting character. He basically ran this freak show place. It was kind of like where the Shredder kids hung out and smoked butts and skateboarded, you know, from the Ninja Turtles movie. Sure, you know sure, sure. I mean, I, well, I, I know the kids that you're that you're referring to. They, we, yeah, we have them out here on Nair, there. Yeah, like Nair do wells to hang out. If you think about it, really, the Shredder guy was kind of giving these kids a good place to hang out. They weren't doing anything bad but smoking butts, and even that's okay. And so, not that it's okay. It's not okay. And But, but it's, it's okay. It's but, okay. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's all okay. Right. It's all right. It's okay. It could be worse. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm not the Surgeon General or anything. So. Yeah. It's not my responsibility. But the thing is, this place was nuts. It was full of paper mache shit and like a fun place to hang out. And it was the first time, you know, there was like a, com- a kind of competitive, not competitive, but yeah, competitive element to the whole thing. Like it, it was like, yeah, we have a show at the art space and booking a show at the art space was like no big deal. It's like, I guess at the time it seemed like it was, but it was like he just hit up Chef. I, I don't even remember how we would have ever gotten in touch with him. We must have to actually like, call him on the phone or something i mean there must have been email but nothing great we're talking like ask jeeves era type shit and so like and i wasn't asking jeeves about shit no no and not so really like, shit by him no way no way i mean uh, for all i know we bumped into this guy but he had this space was wonderful there and through the throughout history you know i remember you would go in there and you there'd be like the same shit you still see to this day like the graffiti bands all right on the wall in the green room and you're like holy f- Fucking shit. You're telling me Buckethead was at this place once or something? You know what I mean? Yeah, and yeah, like, yeah. there'd be shit like that. And, uh, but it'll be like, you know, bands like, I remember Explosions in the Sky or something like that on their first ever tour. Like, there are bands that at that time in my life I was like very into that I was like, that band played in this fucking place. Wow. And not that, and it, it always seemed magical to me because of how like, you know, it was just a, a great place for people to come together and play music. And I was super influenced by like all the bands that were way better than mine. Unemployed Sidekick, I'm talking about at this point still. In fact, thank God Unemployed Sidekick had a short history and Daniel Stride Tiger picked up because Unemployed Sidekick was hated, hated. Our our website, actually, I wish it was still there. It was like .cmj.net type website, you know, an angel fire type situation. It um the message board was just basically a place to cyber bully me, I feel like. And, and most people, it was just a cyber bullying. Oh, it was awful. It was just horrible, horrible shit. And I was pretty fat at the time, too. And so anyway, Daniel Strap Tiger starts, and it was like we maybe played one or two shows at this art space place, but there were always these bands, a couple bands, or a couple brothers actually in Gloucester, who were in like every band. They were like, it seemed like every weekend there were five new bands and always different like genres. There would be like metalcore, ska, ska core. There was fucking like emo, but then there was like hardcore. And then there was also just like, like math rock and shit was getting fucking crazy. And a lot of these kids super talented and I would just be so enamored by their like finger work on the fretboard, you know? And I thank them for a lot of things, I guess, but I don't know. That's yeah. all I gotta say. Definitely. So <clears throat> did you move from Mass up to uh, 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 over to uh, New York? Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> that was that was the next move. You've been following me, Jacob. Yeah, man. I mean, I do my research, you know. Yeah, I got Nardwar on my team. Oh, uh-huh. helps out a lot. Yeah. Good guy. Yeah. Put him to work. Yeah, I moved to uh, New York City, the big app. Yeah. I actually oh, want to hear about that. Do you want me to tell you about that? Yeah, yeah. I would, I, would, I would I'd love to hear about the journey. I was a young man then, Jacob. And yeah. what happened was I had been working in a tattoo parlor called... Uh, well, that part doesn't matter. I didn't do tattoos. I worked at the front desk, which means mostly dealt with people coming and being like, hey, can I, you pierce my dick? And I'd be like, oh, no. But that guy can. And um, <laughs> a lot of dick piercing questions. I mean, fine. It's a fine thing. It's just funny to be put in a position where you're like, oh, no, I can sell you like a bong. And I am having a really hard time with the register at the moment. But like, 
I love that job. It was really funny and hilarious. And I had a great time and got a couple free tattoos and it was great. And then I moved to New York because uh, I fucking hate Massachusetts. And so don't like it and or I didn't anymore. And so did you fly or I drive to, there? I drove down bus, Feng Hua. And then I guess my shit arrived. Um, I don't know who my, I suppose my butler must have brought it. But anyway, I don't know how it got down there, but it did. And I lived, so I had a friend, if, if memory serves, I, I honestly did move to New York with just a big metal um, shelving unit, like a sketchy metal shelving unit that like a killer would hang his weapons from. I don't even know how I got it. I think it was given to me as like a housewarming present, like a killer shelf. And, um, and I didn't even ever use the thing because I didn't have any shit to put on it. So I lived in a basement apartment. My friend Steve, he was old. He's older. I guess he still is older than me. Uh, he was the first person I knew who moved down there. And he was living in Williamsburg at the time, which was a, like, you know, people talk about this shit all the time. You know, people are always like, it's just not what it used to be, man. I remember when, I remember when the Statue of Liberty was fucking... You know, she used to have like a pack of cigarettes in her pocket or whatever. <laughs> like, uh, the Empire State Building, it used to be like a fucking, if you, uh, at nighttime, it was a strip club. Or, you know, whatever people say about shit. And, um, you know, Williamsburg, at my t- initial time going there, I was South Third Street, South Third between Bedford and Barry, which at the time there was really anything over there. This, we're talking 2008 around about so we had main drag music which is wonderful that was a a high point but mainly we lived in the basement of this building underneath a biker gang called the legion of doom run by a guy named lucifer jesse was his real name and man oh hi was it a fucking riot i never even had a key to this fucking place because lucifer would always be out on the he like decorated the sort of entryway to be i mean it was just a bunch of jaegermeister signs and lights and shit motorcycles everywhere like kawasaki's and they were partying we always would end up drinking this shit called ice house and you know i think when i moved in there i was the 19th roommate in a year that eventually like something like 40 people it was a flop house basically there were no windows and shit illegal could not rent it now maybe you could but at any rate yeah horror horrible living conditions how much and, is uh, rent how, how, how much you paying honestly, in rent? pretty fucking expensive it was six hundred dollars a month <laughs> which is like still expensive sounding to me i didn't have a window i didn't know what the weather was like until i was like already late for work and so many times it'd be like raining and shit i was like wow this is gonna be affecting me somehow and uh i worked for a moving company which is fucking awesome that's the best i recommend moving for a working uh Moving, working for a moving company in a city that you just moved to it has to be a city though. Don't be doing it in like Norman, Oklahoma. <laughs> Definitely don't do it in like Tallahassee. City only. Um, I, I feel like that'd be way life. more stressful though. I mean, because you got you got these cars going going by so people all the time. Yeah, and, and you you, you got to bring all that stuff downstairs. Oh, oh man. and that, dude. And so, up, I mean, yeah. I got in pretty good shape, and you can make a lot of money. And also, it was weird because I had no experience. We, a uh, friend of a friend, he started a moving company. He decided to move to, move to New York from college. He went to UMass Amherst, where all the arty kids go, the freaks. And uh, he was like, I'm going to start a moving company, a moving company called College Educated Movers. And this is during the recession. So it's meant to be a bit tongue in cheek. Like he had a college degree, but he can't get a job. So he opens a moving company. But the thing is, people thought of it. I'll be honest with you. What it was is rich people loved this company because they're like oh sophisticates like ourselves we can have college educated movers movers from our flat in the upper west down to soho and that's the primary clientele were wicked fucking rich people and we didn't have insurance or anything i barely knew how to fucking carry i could barely do anything if we had ever dropped an heirloom or faberge egg we would have been shot and killed on the spot and the shit you see on that job like that is remarkable and it's story in and of itself. But what I'm trying to get at here is that Lucifer was fucking crazy and he had a gun, right? Who would have thought a guy named Lucifer would be crazy and would have a gun? I, a I, gun 
Yeah. Well, the thing about his gun is is this. I mentioned he didn't have. I didn't have keys to this place. I don't know that there was a lock on the door. And the reason for it is because one time, I remember walking home with one of the roommates. I'm telling you, barely knew these people's names. Billy, I think his name was. Billy was getting a hard time from somebody in the street, some ne'er do well, some other fucking asshole, somebody who was all liquored up. And Lucifer pops out of the goddamn place with a gun and is and is like, like barking all this crazy shit in defense of weak little roommate guy who doesn't want to get hurt, you know, and I can't help him because I forget why I'm hurt at the time, too. You're moving shit. I have shit to move my goddamn fucking. I have the sciatica. And so the thing about it is Lucifer pops out. out. He didn't give a fuck about Billy. He hated the fact that we were moving. in. Well, he liked it in a way that we were like moving into this neighborhood. But he was so protective of it. There was a gang war at the time going on in South Williamsburg between Lucifer's gang, the Legion of Doom, and another gang, a fucking machete gang, kids with machetes. And I'd be like walking home from like wherever i just had like the best latte in town and i was like hi lucifer what's popping man you check out this new twitter app and he's like there's kids with machetes at night make yourself inside if you happen to hear the sounds of the slashing machete and i was like what does that sound like and anyway so lucifer <laughs> wanted to keep he was trying to keep shit safe around there and didn't want the machete kids getting closer to our side of town which man if you think about what it looks like now there it's so funny but Anyway, he'd pop out with a gun and be like, don't fuck with Billy. Billy's with me. And then, you know, the person would run away and cry and be afraid. And I was like, huh? do you love us? You know, it felt so good. But anyway, it was a weird time. And now it's so fucking crazy because same street. I was down there recently. I sent you Google map image search proof of this. Lucifer's long gone. Legion of Doom is folded. It's, it's shuttered its doors. But what's fucking nuts is there's city bikes on the, the street exactly where the old Kawasaki's used to be parked all the time. Paying homage. There's some, there's, there's some good. There's there's something there, you know. I, I'm, I'm going to work it into my my book. Yeah, I, I would. I would definitely. I mean, that that is, that is the part that you need to add for sure. <laughs> I think it'll be a big book. Good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as as it should be. So now we're going to get to the nitty gritty of it. When and how did you start playing in Barquet Courts? All right, I'm going to have to get a sip of seltzer water for this. Please, one, but... go ahead. Yeah. What the, the whistle? The story dates back um, to fucking 2008 or... No, sorry, 2006. You know, I have a hard time with 2008 and 2006. Not so much 2007, but can't tell the difference between six and eight. Anyway, so Daniel Stripe Tiger good band me guitar player wicked talented i we go on tour of the entire united states of america and we have a show at andrew savage's fucking house in denton and it was awesome great time andrew and i immediately hit it off stayed friends i guess if you count today forever and we did a split record teenage cool kids and daniel stripe tiger did a split seven inch the daniel stripe tiger side is better and I got a copy of it lying around here somewhere. I'll send it to you. And yeah, it's, it was great, great times. And then I was living in New York for a while. At this point, I'd, got, I'd started working at Vice. And Andrew asked me to write the press release for a Ferguson Geronimo record. And it would have been maybe a little bit since we'd talked. And then he mentioned in the email he was moving to New York. And did I want to hang out? And I was like, absolutely, baby. And we got together just, you know, the way friends do. And we're still friends after all those years. Um, he had an iPhone, which he never has had ever again since. And uh, then shortly after that, he was like, would you want to like play music or be in a band, blah, blah, blah. And at the time, I was like working this job that was my full-time job that I had no real business working. I basically lied myself into that position. You can take that and fucking... I, I'm trying to think of a way to diss Vice with all this, honestly. Yeah. I didn't deserve that job. I Shane, didn't have a journalism degree. Shane Smith? Smith? Fuck you. Yeah. Shane Smith? Yeah. And, and now they got that channel, Viceland. Fuck that. Yeah. I do love Sarush, though. I just Prince don't really. Only. I like a couple of the employees, I'll be honest. Okay. But I don't think that, I don't like it there. 
Anyway, so I Uh-oh. had this that I thought was kind of cool, but and I'd motherboard all day long, man. I love those people, but nerds, we did it. We fucking did it. We were the best thing about that whole goddamn place. But anyway, <laughs> and we're gonna start a band. We'll hang out on like Wednesday night and play some tunes. And I say, yes, this will be a fun extracurricular activity because that's all it will be. Because then he goes, he goes, you could play bass in this band. I'm thinking to myself, oh my fucking god. This guy thinks I'm a goddamn idiot or something. He doesn't understand that I can do tapping guitar solos on the fretboard. Yeah. I was you had a 12 string, man. You had a 12 string. You were in it. You were well, in it. Sixes. I was down tuning things. Pedals were being used. Shit was, I was like, okay, baby, I get it. You see that I'm busy. You're going to give me the idiot's guitar with the you say, strings. You say, look, buddy, I'm in drop D tuning right now. Okay. You don't even know what D this is. You can't even. I was like, oh, okay, all right. I thought he was doing me a kindness. I thought I literally, because I played bass in this band, that I was going to have to pay less money for rent at the practice space. And it was not the case. In fact, he took this pretty fucking seriously. I didn't realize that because in the, you know, whatever angular hardcore screamo community that I came from, it was less about the bass. I mean, you had your certain bands who would make a point i mean even now when i listen back to some of that music i can hear the bass lines specifically because i never really paid attention to them and then daniel strap tiger we just told the kid to do what we were doing for the most part because we didn't have time we we're so fast on the frets and so you got burritos to make you got you got shit Dude, going on i'm working out my hands and shit and so yeah it took me a long time to appreciate this instrument even as re- i feel like in the last few years, I mean, I've been in the band for a few years without appreciating it even. But Andrew, it turns out, was is phenomenal. I think he mastered in bass at one point at in college. He he decided to switch majors to watercolor. And can you imagine how good it must feel for him to have succeeded at both of those things? Like people have college degrees and shit that is like not ridiculous to say out loud. No offense, Andrew, but like. He is like a successful musician and a visual artist. He, he can just, he lives to stuff it in the face of the man. Yeah, yeah. Props to Andrew. This one goes out to Andrew. Yeah. Anyway, I didn't even have a bass at the time. I Andrew. Played. Andrew. Rudy. Andrew. Almost his birthday. Um, yeah, I played a fretless bass that was lent to me in Ibanez by my friend Ian. On the very first Park Kick Quartz album of all time, American Specialties, you can hear it it's sliding around and all slippity sloppity. And yeah, we got, it just kept happening every fucking Wednesday. The next thing I knew, we had shows coming up. A lot of them. I was looking back at emails from all back then because we're reissuing American Specialties on vinyl soon. And I was asked to write liner notes for it, which I think I still have to do. But um, I was trying to go through the old emails and see what kind of fucking little twerps we were like back then. And it turns out I actually didn't go to a lot of our shows. They played a lot of shows without me. Because I didn't, because I had stuff to do, press junkets and whatnot. And it's just fucking funny. I, I feel pretty bad about it. I really did not give them a lot of respect. So, sorry. But now, but, but now it's different. Now it's different. Now it's different. Now, of course, you appreciate I, the bass. You appreciate the band. I yeah. like the contributions I've made. I feel good about it. I think the fans do too, definitely. Yeah. I don't know. I, I try. I mean, it's like, it can be a message for anything out there. I hope that you want my messages is that really just fake it till you make it or just if you want to do it do you can do it if you want you can which was that daniel striped tiger thing actually yeah and and if you can you want too and that's that's not a daniel striped tiger thing can i call you jig yeah dude whatever what's call, your middle name it's dean jdb dean is an awesome you know it's so interesting i have been considering an alter ego named Dean because Dean and Sean are spelled almost exactly the same way. Yeah, definitely. S and a D. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then and then you got that guy Dean Moriarty. Uh, Dean, James uh, Dean. Dean Jimmy Dean. It's it's, it's also yeah. Yeah. Wait yeah. a second. No, Jimmy Dean and James Dean aren't the same guy. No, Jimmy Dean makes the sausages. Uh what? Are they the same guy? James Dean was a cowboy actor. It's true. And he wasn't in sure. that, that many films. But and you know, Jimmy Dean kind of popped up around the same time. They I don't know. Similar vibe, too, honestly. He could have faked the death. 
I'm not putting it Cowboys. past it. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of people. I'm wait. I've, how many active fake deaths are happening? I mean, how many are there? Who out there is chomping at the bit to be like, I didn't fake it? You know, there's got to be a couple. Like, you know, I'm always hoping it's going to be Mitch Hedberg. But you know the way he'd pop oh, up, man. so like weird. He would just like get carded at a 7-Eleven or something, and the person would be like, "Are you Mitch?" At, like, and he'd just be like. <laughs> yeah, just, just just super super just like he's just casual. waiting to get carded for something so that he can reveal that he's not dead i'll tell you something about mitch hedberg real quick i was on the youtube the other day and his half hour his uh-huh. Comedy central half hour uh was recommended i said you know what I, I haven't watched this in years i gotta i gotta watch it and it's so great and he tanks in the beginning of it just like nobody is understanding what he's doing yeah. And like finally at the end, they're all with him. He's like, "Oh shit, I gotta let's retape this." <laughs> oh yeah, like, yeah. But I kind of remember that. I feel like I even. What are some of the jokes in the in the? Is it one of his? Because I I also remember hearing one where it's like he he talks about it being a re-recorded thing, like throughout it. Like it's a weird referential thing, or maybe you know what? I might be thinking of the infamous Rick Rubin produced Andrew Dice Clay album, which is fucking insane. But I love Mitch Hedberg so much. I didn't know Rick Rubin produced Andrew Dice Clay album. That's it's strange, right? You should definitely listen to it. It's honestly like a kind of like it's like a surreal experience because it he it's like during a like a low point in the Dice Man's career. So people it's not like he tanks. He's just not liked by people. And he refuses to like give up his persona. So a lot of the jokes are like, you know, like about like roadhead or like, you know, weird sex shit or like, you know, like uh, sex crap. And the people are just like, bah, bah. And I mean, kind of rightly so. But the way that he's able to not crack at all is so fucking compelling. Check it out. It's called like Worst Night of My Life, 1980 something. Something oh, like man. that. But uh, Mitch, God, I love Mitch. There was, fuck, I was just thinking of one of the one of my favorite jokes of his the other day. It was like, oh, fuck. Oh, refried beans. It was like, oh, God. Do you remember? Do you know what I'm talking about? He talks about refried beans. Um, why? See, I can't even think of what it is. I have to look it up. For the listeners of the podcast, is this a visual show as well? People are gonna see this? No, no, no. It's a, it's a audio. I, I'm, I, I'm thinking about making it, um, digital too. But I, I, I have not. And I don't. I don't kind of don't intend to. I don't know. The listeners don't say like, hey, put up the video. So, but yeah. So, so you you're go, good. You're good. To answer he goes, your I like question. refried. He goes. I like refried beans. That's why I want to try fried beans because maybe they're just as good, and we're just wasting time. You don't have to fry them again after all. So good. God, yeah, yeah, he was great. And another great uh, comedian from Massachusetts, Stephen Wright, very, very oh, yeah, yeah. straightforward. What a, Jesus Christ almighty. What a guy. Yeah. Um, I only, I'm more into magicians, actually. And it's funny because there's a great episode of Andrew Dice Clay has the kind of, like, I don't know if you ever watched this, but he had a show that was kind of like his Curb Your Enthusiasm, same general. It's like he went up to someone who was like, hey, like, I want to do the thing Larry David does, but with the dice. And they're like, all right, what do you want to call it? And he's like, dice or something. And it's honestly, I think it's really good, but specifically, there's one episode with Chris Angel. Ah, I mean, this one episode was like my fucking stoned ape experience where I was like, it was like I licked a toad in the fucking woods and I had become like this like DMT alien spirit. I saw things from a new perspective after this episode of television, which I highly recommend to everyone out there. Yeah, it's it's called probably Dice Man or something. Dice. Oh, yeah, we got to tell that. I mean, you might not be able to find it. And I think it's on Showtime and not many people do Showtime. No, no. I actually did get Showtime kind of. What for? What for? What did you want that you want that you got? Because that's why you get Showtime for one thing. Yeah, Twin Peaks. It was the, it was. Uh, the, I got into Twin Peaks and I watched the movie, and then I needed to watch the um the the second part of it. 
So I was like, okay, I'm I'm in it. And then also I watched uh, a Wu, the Wu Tang Clan documentary ah. thing on there too, which is great as well. I haven't seen that. It's good. I, honestly, it's good. weirdly, I have not watched the second, like this, you know, the next season of Twin Peaks. It's like the thing I'm saving for like my final days. It's 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 great. The the return. Yeah. Oh, I can't wait. I just like I'll hear shit about it. I, a friend of mine, her uh annie annie hart her band of Voir simon is in an episode or two they're like fr- friends and annie's husband is the parquet courts tour manager god bless him doug, Woo! And up, anyway, doug? She, they like love david lynch loves annie and uh annie's bandmates and stuff so she has a lot of weird stories about dave i love dave yeah it's funny because i was just thinking about dune earlier Mm, that's not that you know me and dune yeah dune and of course um Boom, yeah. yeah exactly bingo mulholland drive. mulholland drive you know mulholland drive is so fucked up because I, I didn't get it you know when i was a kid i was like this is art baby it's art you know what it is though it's like any time i'm in los angeles i get that movie's just about a time you're in los angeles that shit happens every time i'm in los angeles i haven't i haven't seen it i gotta i, I gotta see that one um, Check it out, and the next time you're in LA, you'll be like, "God damn it, I could have done Mulholland Drive." Yeah, I mean, but nobody could do anything like Lynch does anything. I Definitely. feel like, but he's—I absolutely agree. He's I great. Went to an ex- uh, he had like an art exhibit. There was like an installation in Paris. I was in Paris, and it was an installation that was like all sets from his shit. Like, uh, so you could walk through like some of the moments of his films, and it was. It was really fucking creepy and awesome, but it was a, a shame because there was like this $200 fucking espresso kid thing at the end. I never got to get it, but it was wonderful. And he has a bar in, I think it's a bar you'd call it. I feel like it's in Paris. Actually, It's called Silencio. And man, is it a fucking trip? There's like a smoking se- section in there. After you get wicked drunk on tequila, you wander around. It's like a immersive experience. You're like hanging on shit and like a wizard says shit backwards to you and you're like, okay, okay. and you get sucked into like a hole. And then the next thing you know it, you're smoking butts, but you're in the forest outside and not in France. And then you go back in and it's fine. And it's yeah, just yeah. like, re- I swear to God, all that shit happened at this place, but it was my, I did drink all the tequila. You d- drink all of it, huh? They uh, had it there for us. Oh, we played a show there. I forgot about that, but I fell down. Wait, you, wait, you play a show with who? Was it after show? So, like a, we got invited to play at this Silencio bar, and I remember I slipped and fell on the ground because I was so smashed, fucking shit plastered on tequila. Were you were, were you a big drinker as a as a youth? <laughs> yeah, I stopped drinking because of it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. Sometimes you got to do that, right? Why not? I mean, the thing is, I realized at a certain point, not even that long ago, that I had um, not ever played a park at court show sober. I mean, not that I was always wasted, but I was like a big take the edge off kind of guy. Have a drink. And, yeah. and I guess the first time I played sober was not the right time to do it because I like immediately, I don't want to say relapse, but I did drink as soon as the show was over. Um, and it was when we played with the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra. And it was so weird because it was just like not the right show to test sobriety out at. And um, I was like, there's no way I can fucking do this ever again without huffing fucking paint, drinking fucking schnapps, smoking fucking cigs. <laughs> yeah. But now, but now it's now you're done. Stone cold soap. No problem. I mean, I'll oh, smoke wow. a cigarette here and there. Not so much. Nah, I guess. I don't know. It depends on how you. Yeah. I try to keep things straight. As far as that shit goes, it's tough. I don't know. On the edge, right? On the straight edge. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's me. Yeah, definitely. When uh, uh, when do you... Okay, so you guys you guys are playing for, for a few years. You in, in parquet courts. And uh, when when do you start to see some some uh, some new fans and some notoriety happen within the band? Well, I had just, well, I guess, you know what? It, so Light Up Guild, the album, that one came out. We So I remember specifically, we had 
a tour booked that I used like all of my vacation days for. It was like you, we got like 10 days vacation or something. It was crazy. And I was like, I'm just going to take, I'll take all of it to do this tour. And it was, I had got a lot of support from one of the founders of Vice, which is why I cannot completely talk shit about that company, though I have tons of shit I'm happy to say. But Saru Shalvi, if you're out there, man, I do really appreciate you. He had a lot of faith in this band. And in fact, I was just texting with him the other day because of this liner notes thing, because he was the first person I gave a tape to, the first American Specialties thing. And it was like, I don't know. It, it was a really warm kind of thing. He was always really into the idea that I was like probably better off doing the band than being at Vice, which in a way, one way makes me wonder if he thought I sucked at my job, but in another way, it feels kind of prodigal sunny. So we'll go with that. At any rate, <laughs> I have va- these vacation days and I'm like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go on tour. And at that point, I'd been on tour with Dan Stripe Tiger. We did a lot of touring. We did the US, we did Europe, we did Australia. All of that. So I was like, I can do another thing in the van. I'm not doing that. And it was, you know, your great, you know, classic sleeping on floors, smoking jankum kind of type tour or whatever. And it was no big deal. It was great. The first show was in Detroit. It took 20. Wait, it took like 18 hours to get there because there was a blizzard. I'm not convinced we didn't die during that. And this is all whatever. Purgatory. And um, great time. And by the end of that tour, which was, you know, went as far as like, yeah, Chicago we, and then kind of scooped through back Pittsburgh and all back um, to New York. It was pretty, I guess, nine or 10 days. By the end of that tour, it was like the record label, What's Your Rupture, who put the record out. Kevin was like, you have to go on tour again. <laughs> and I was like, ah, sorry, I got to work. And he was like, you're going to have to quit your fucking job. You work for me now. I was like, all right. So I quit. And then the next thing I knew, we were in California, the whole thing, the West Coast. That was fucking crazy. And it just never ended. Honestly, it just kept being like a thing where all of a sudden we'd have like, we had like a booking agent. In, well, we've had, we've worked with one of the most wonderful human people on earth. Timmy Hefner has been like our booking agent in the US forever. And I, and we, you know, Andrew and I both come from like a DIY punk background and so is timmy like so many people that are in the community the music music community that i feel be- like lucky to be part of are people i re- i met back in the Daniel Sharp tiger days. and i like that like shit i like feeling i have that there's some control there you know like not getting fucked over by big daddy music industry and um no fuck me big daddy music industry if you will for cash and so um, oh my god, I have no idea. So yeah, it just kept going, going, going. The next thing I know, we have like a French guy who's emailing us, being like, "Bonjour, mesdemoiselles, we are playing shows in Paris." And I was like, "What the fuck? Are we going on tour in Europe?" And it was just like, "We're touring Europe using a a hat, like a winter hat, as a merch. We use it for our merch money." And on the last show of that tour in spain we were like oh my god we made seven like thousand dollars or something it's in the hat and then the hat got stolen and the whole tour was pointless and it was um still fun though i was like i was like surely this is how it ends i mean and they're like no actually you have to keep doing more of it and i was like all right and the next thing i know it's just like now today but that's that, awesome. so. But now we've got a great crew. I love everybody we work with. Honestly, good family dynamic. Good man. That's that. That's okay. awesome to hear, dude. Yeah, that's that is really great. But hey, man, we we got to wrap this up. But how oh. how I wrap this up is is uh, through some promotional stuff. So you can find Parquet Courts music on all streaming platforms, all of them, right? Every single goddamn one. Good deal. And you can buy the merch at uh, hellomerch.com, right? Absolutely. Awesome, man. Awesome. And is there is there anything else? Um, no. That's it. Well, right. actually, hold on. I miss you all so much. I really mean that. I'm not just saying it. I really am a sensitive guy. I'm a Pisces and everything. I w- cannot wait. And as soon as we play music again live and I'm vaccinated, you're vaccinated and we're all good to go. I want you to come up to me and just, I'm going to do a hug. I'm talking to you, Jacob. I'm talking to everybody out there. 
I will. I will see. I, I not in Orange County. You're not coming back here. I know, but I'll, I will see you in LA. You better believe it, baby. All right, man. I'll, I'll talk to you in one second. I'm gonna. I'm gonna stop recording this. Thank you, man. Bye.